Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News, Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. On Heartbeat Alaska, we travel to remote villages and sites throughout the north. And today, we travel to Saxman, Alaska and visit with Joe Williams as he explains the totem pole culture down there, what they represent, and what they're all about. We travel to Southwest Alaska as well and learn about major changes taking place in that part of Alaska. Good changes. I'll be back with Saxman and Western Alaska right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you Frontier for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. And a special thank you to Scan Home and Scan Office Furnishings. And thank you Alaska Commercial Company for your support. Welcome back. Travel with me now to Southeast Alaska, to the beautiful historical village of Saxman, located just outside of Ketchikan. tribal uh, leaders that were coming to find the place along with a man named Samuel Saxman uh, ran into a storm, thus lost their lives. So in honor of Samuel Saxman, who was the Presbyterian missionary, this place was named after him. And so that's, that's how Saxman got its name. Founded, in, actually they settled in 1894 settlement of about 75 to 100, 100 folks living in this community. Today we have right at about 450 or so. Take a look at, uh, we'll start off with this one pole here. This is the Seward's pole. This, this is, is Joe Williams, up. friend of the it's community, pole, outspoken leader, like devoted father. Today, Joe takes time out of his busy schedule to tell us about some of these large symbols of this community. It's a job he has a passion for. A total of 29 totem poles here in this community. Not all poles tell stories. And uh, oftentimes we're asked, how do you read the story of the pole from the top down to the bottom up? You actually don't, you just tell the story. You take a look at it and it's a story how you come to know that story is it's told to you just like I'm doing now. Take a look at, uh, we'll start off with this one pole here. This is the Seward's pole. This is kind of like a, it was a potlatch pole, but also it was like a debtor's pole and a shame pole. Why a shame? Because when a potlatch is given, one is expected in return. Even though Seward was uh, uh, was counseled to give a potlatch in return, he never did. And so as a result, uh, a potlatch was, was given in his honor to show folks that he is indebted to the people of this community and is yet to pay it back. Once he pays it back, then that pole can come down. So as a result, his family is shamed until that has occurred. In this particular case, it would be the family of the United States because he was representing that family. Now, <clears throat> you have another pole here, <clears throat> which is the Keat, Keats pole. You have the three bears and, and then uh, uh, the, the mother bear 
and, and the man. Uh, this particular pole is kind of related to this one here as well. And, and um, what occurred is that the man was out hunting and he, uh, he was gone for days and, and then uh, uh, became somewhat disoriented. And uh, with this, he f fell in love with this very beautiful woman who turned out to be uh, a female brown bear. They had three cubs, and for a long time, he, he, during their marriage, he really wanted to go back and visit his family back in the village. And his wife uh, was very reluctant and finally gave in and instructed his, the cubs that, uh, that if this should occur, he was instructed not to look at his first wife he was instructed not to do this. And, and uh, if this would occur, it would cost him his life. And as, as he was visiting his family in the village, he was walking around, kind of like came around the corner of a house, and there stood his first wife. And so with that, as instructed by, by, uh, by their mother, the three cubs killed the, the, uh, the man. So when, when you see these three cubs looking down and the mother of, of, of this particular pole, she's way up in the mountain and she's always looking down on the village of where her husband was killed, feeling the sorrow of it. And, and that's the part of this story of this particular pole here. A woman's work's never done. <laughs> <laughs> the most important things in life are the ones closest to home, family, and Joe has a wonderful one. We drop in on him and see that even great men of the community are not above helping out at home. Actually, I have six kids, four boys, two girls. Um, three boys are now out of the house. At times when I stand here, I look at these pictures, and these are the people that I pray for. You know, I pray for them every time I look at them. Pray for them. And, and just, it's not in-depth prayer, it's just the Lord, just to make sure they're good, good health. Um, you know, make sure that uh, what they're doing is good for them, and that they make a difference in your world. You know, so, keep them safe, keep them healthy, you know, let them affect somebody else's life for God. Hey everyone, is your home or office furniture showing its age? Let Scan Home and Office update your image. Albert's the expert. Give him a call, toll free. <laughs> he can create the perfect furniture layout in the space you have available. He can even do this over the web. Scan Home wants to become your rural home office furniture supplier. It's mine. They even have financing options. Stop in at the corner of 36th and Arctic. The trees are on, we to uh, 0, 2, and 20. So the 20 line and uh, 0, 2, and then we're out. Okay, and what side traffic can you make? So you want to try to touch down at the beginning portion of the runway. Kuluk Sox traffic says 976 November is on base for runway. Sometimes when they go to watch the games, they run out of referees. A lot of people don't like to referee, just because they go to play, they go to watch. And, and I enjoy it. To Joe, basketball isn't just a game. It's a way to support the community, spend time with his daughter, and get in shape. Actually, watching Elizabeth, you know, she's my daughter, watching her play. Okay. I just wish at times I had more time to, to play basketball with her, but just don't. You know? Not having enough time is a problem of being so involved in the community. 
but Joe sees this as more of a challenge than a problem. To ease some of the effects of being so busy, Joe gets his family involved in his projects. If you can't beat him, join him. Uh, I, think, I think we were the only ones from Alaska again this time though, weren't we? Yeah, we were the only ones from Alaska again, so. Pretty much this year, um, we just started breaking off the new group and the old group. Um, Joe sees most of his best work at the city council meeting. Not only does he have a voice in the community, he gets to hear other ideas, as well as help problem solve issues that may come up in town. I'm really excited about our community's future. I'm very excited about our community's future because of our leadership that is being developed today. What does Joe get out of all this public service? Well, satisfaction of a job well done. With his voice in the community, he also gets a chance to influence the way things get done. In addition to the community council, Joe finds pleasure serving people at church, and we mean serving. Next time you're in Saxman, join Joe on Sunday morning for a cup of, well, Joe. Everybody knows Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a service. It's, a, it's what uh, we provide for the folks that, that attend. And it could be the real reason that they come is so they can have come to our church so they can have coffee. You know, not all churches serve all churches. And uh, it, it's just a... Uh, the way of being a servant to those who want to be served. It's not a big deal to us. Not a big deal, maybe. But lots of people do get a lot of joy out of sharing in the fellowship that after worship service brings. And anytime you can get service with a smile, well, that is just a great way to start off the week. My involvement with the organizations began when I was 16 years old. I, I, um, was involved in the Alaska Native Brotherhood. That was for a number of years, and, and then following the Alaska Native Brotherhood, got involved with Alaska or with the Clinkin Haida Central Council, which are Clinkin Haida Community Council. And then uh, uh, I got elected to the City Council uh, upon my return from college, and then um, uh, got elected into the. Uh, organized village of Saxman. Following that, um, I was city city manager of Saxman for uh, just under a year. Um, after I became president of the organized village of Saxman, got involved in in on a statewide basis, uh, Alaska Intertribal Council. Uh, through a couple of years of that, I I became vice chairman of Alaska Intertribal Council. And that's what I serve today. Being a longtime resident, Joe has made many longtime friends. Just think that Joe's a really special guy. He's um, kind of a go-between to, between people. He knows the old traditions, and he knows how to work with um, the new people. Joe is a fantastic guy. He's. Uh, well known around uh, Ketchikan and, and the Saxman area. I think he's lived here all of his life. His family's here. He, you know, he, he tells the people about our community, and you know the way it is and the way it was. He's just a, a really personal person, and just as someone that, that everyone likes. Wasn't that beautiful? We'll be traveling more to Southeast Alaska this summer and get some wonderful, wonderful stories from the good people in that area. I'll be back real shortly with Western Alaska and Deborah Bo. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. Mokai. 
the versatile, durable, environmentally friendly and fuel efficient watercraft that's fun and easy to own. The strong polyethylene hull withstands scratches and impacts from river rocks. The jet pump requires only four inches, allowing for shallow water access, and the three gallon tank provides eight to 10 hours of use. The engine and jet pump can be removed without tools in under a minute, making transport, storage an easy task. Mokai, accept no boundaries. Western Alaska is undergoing changes these days. Deborah Vo has the story. Thanks, Jeannie. I was born in St. Mary's, a village in Western Alaska. Western Alaska is one of the largest and most rural regions of the state. However, it is also one of limited economic opportunity, being separated from the industrial and commercial centers that fuel much of Alaska's bustling economy. This vast area relies on one major industry, fishing. Unfortunately, it is an industry largely controlled by outside interests, which in the past have left little room for local fishermen to expand their economic horizons. But today, that situation is changing very rapidly for 20 villages located on the shores of the Yukon Kuskokwim Bay and the Bering Sea. Joining together, these communities created a unique development organization, the Coastal Villages Region Fund, known locally by the initials CVRF, or simply Coastal Villages. For the past several years, CVRF financed by royalties received from regional fishing quotas, has invested in its member communities, creating numerous human resource programs aimed at providing entry-level jobs and advancement opportunities for local residents. Through a variety of scholarships, internships, and apprenticeships, many people, both young and old, are learning new skills and using them to secure stable jobs. What type of jobs? Primarily, they are focused on the seafood industry. A goal of CBRF is to help people who already have a long tradition of subsistence fishing to learn the modern skills necessary to not only improve their catch of commercially viable fish, but also to process and add value to their catch. To help villages develop these new seafood resources, CBRF created Coastal Villages Seafoods, LLC. This for-profit company is responsible for harvesting, processing, and marketing the salmon and halibut catch coming from member villages. Through grants from CBRF, villages are developing the infrastructure and technical abilities necessary to effectively manage processing plants as well as the many other operations necessary to support commercial fishing operations. It is the perfect industry for Western Alaskan residents, and it is making a difference in the villages who are part of CBRF. These communities have seen the value of working together as a group to create benefits for all. These benefits are easily counted. One, employ rural residents specifically within its cluster member villages to, to help the fishermen and fisherwomen make money and doing something they've been doing for generations. And three, being flexible enough to help opportunities present themselves to rural residents within its cluster villages. And it's doing a great job in offering future opportunities, future possibilities to its members. The underlying philosophy guiding this effort to help villagers create their own economic future is seen in the four major elements of the organization's foresight program. These are scholarship, internship, training, and employment. It's an effort that's benefiting a wide range of participants. The jobs created by Coastal Villages Seafoods, LLC, cover all aspects of the fishing industry, from working at land-based and at-sea processing operations, handling fish, buying, and marketing the final products. Just how well this program is working can be seen in the village of Quinnahawk. 
Two seasons ago, CBS came to the village with a proposal to the community's fish processing plant that had been setting idle for several years. They hired a local manager and set about providing the step-by-step -step support necessary to get the plant into operation. We had to get all the supplies in by the barge. Everything CVS ordered came in barge or planes, and the only thing the village had was the plant. Without CVS, that plant wouldn't be running. The plant has completed its second successful season, providing more than 80 good paying jobs local residents are happy to have, even though the hours are long and the work demanding. Starting from the processors, slimers, got foremen, got graders, got chip out personnel, we got clerks and ticket riders, anything fishery related. Fishermen usually goes out at 9 o'clock. On a good day, they start delivering by 12 noon. And they average anywhere from 800 to 1,000 pounds. We can have up to 300 boats fishing in Quinhock, that's uh, District W4. Villages from the Kaskukwem, uh, all over the place come in. We had up to 15 villages fishing in Queen Hawk alone. Once the fish start arriving at the dock, the heavy processing work begins. We get them graded at the dock, bring them over to the plant. When the, when the processing line starts, we HNG all the fish, chill them, and then the next day, start on the ship out. The workers average 16 to 18 hour days I usually open up the plant six o'clock in the morning, and all the workers start about one o'clock in the afternoon, till about whenever they're done, usually four or five in the morning. The fishing season covers the runs of kings and reds, but CVS, the fishermen, and the plant operations team are looking to expand their activities in the future. Catches of halibut are already being handled and value-added activities such as filleting, smoking, and salting are being given serious consideration. If we had that value-added program going, we'd be given more money to the fishermen. There'd be a lot more jobs and everybody you know, there'll be people coming from other villages to come and work. The Quinnahawk story is important for CVS and other CBRF member villages because it demonstrates how a very basic activity can be built into an important engine of economic opportunity by and for local residents. In the past, it's always been non-resident, non-native companies. And I think there's an opportunity now for native people to take a hold of their own destiny and to take care of their own resource, both as commercial fishermen, but also as processors, as value-added people involved in the industry. They can follow their fish all the way through its whole processing stage up into the market. It's been a long time in coming, but I think they are in a position now to follow it through. Through the efforts of CVS and CVRF, member villages are demonstrating to communities throughout Western Alaska how to develop successful local business ventures. We're in a good position where we're leading and we're the, uh, the major ball players in the, the industry at this time. And uh, with that, you know, I'm very proud that uh, CD, um, uh, CVRF is in this position to do it. We're developing economic strength within the community, such as, uh, you know, if from the royalty monies, we are granting um, projects within the communities. And in turn, uh, the people apply for jobs, and that creates, you know, economic strength. It is important to note that this new economic strength involves more than creating community projects. 
It also brings about changing attitude toward work as well as equipping people to handle new skills. In just a few short years, the Coastal Villages Region Fund and Coastal Villages Seafood have helped spark and support an effort that is greatly benefiting the villages, which are part of the organization. Training programs are expanding, new business ventures are taking shape, and people are excited about the economic opportunities developing throughout these western Alaskan communities, opportunities they themselves are creating. When it comes to coastal villages, over the years that the CDQ program has been operational and in place, I've watched the organization grow, become more sophisticated. The um, quality of people that the organization has nurtured has greatly increased um, to a fine, high caliber of professionals that are interested in their work and do a wonderful job. The lessons learned by those participating in these training programs and economic development ventures offer an important model to other communities. However, the continued success and expansion of this effort requires the support of a network of sponsors as well as organizations and individuals who see the potential for expanding this remarkable effort to other areas facing a limited or uncertain economic future. To find out more about CBRF and CBS LLC and how you can become involved in the mission of the advancement, call toll-free 1-888-795-5151. Got the village's support. The whole village seems like is just giving me, you know, just keep it up, keep it up, don't, don't stop. Join me again soon for more news about Coastal Villages Region Fund. For Heartbeat Alaska and Coastal Villages Region Fund, I'm Deborah Vo. Thank you, Deborah Vo. We'll be seeing more of you in the future right here on Heartbeat Alaska, and we hope to see you as well. I want to thank you for joining us, and please join me again next week for more Native news, Native information. God bless every single one of you. We'll see you then.